Morning. Why don't you pull up a chair like I just did? Uh, we're going to talk about TIG welding today, which TIG welding, which stands for tungsten inert gas, and I'll get into why it's called that later, is what I primarily do as a welder. And I'm looking at sharing my knowledge with people out there that are new. If you're a seasoned veteran in TIG welding or an expert or think you're an expert, this video probably isn't going to be for you. So this is mainly going to be for the people who are in school learning about TIG welding or someone who wants to learn more about it and maybe will never TIG weld. So anyways, TIG welding, which the TIG stands for tungsten inert gas, is a welding process in which you use electricity to create heat in order to melt metal together. What I have in front of me here is a TIG torch. So this is what actually passes electricity to the metal through the tungsten, which is referring to this piece right here. What we'll do is we're gonna start by taking apart this torch and I'll talk about the components of it as well as how it works. And then we'll go on from there. So I'm taking the back cap off of this. What this back cap does is it presses on a collet in order to hold the tungsten in place and it also forms a seal. You have your tungsten here, you have your collet here. I'm gonna unscrew this cup. This is your ceramic cup. And then here we have a gas lens that I'm unscrewing. And I'll set that right there. So here is your torch. You have your body, this is the head of it, and then this is your gas line and electrical cable. So let's start at the real basic stuff. This cable here provides both the argon shielding gas and it provides electricity. So it's both a, like a copper cable with a gas line inside. You have your handle, which is just hollow, and then you come up to the head of the torch. The head basically has a machine brass uh, body in it that allows the argon gas to flow through it as well as to pass electricity. Now, let me move that out of the way for a second. To show you how this kind of works, let me take this tungsten and just push it through here and then I'll actually set this right here. So this is all screwed together, if you can picture that brass body and a torch right here, as this tailpiece pushes against the collet into what is the collet body, or in this case, the gas lens, it just squeezes a tungsten to where you can't move it. But electricity passes through this part here into the tungsten through the collet, and then the tungsten passes electricity onto the metal. Now, in the case of this setup, I generally use what's called a gas lens, which is easily identifiable. It's got a little like mesh screen and this one definitely probably could use to be, yeah, it could be replaced, it's pretty filthy in there. I use that versus what's known as a standard collet body. The reason is, is that you get better directional gas flow and gas coverage. So the welds that you produce look better. They have less oxide, uh, they're shinier. In a case of stainless steel, you have to use gas lenses over collet bodies. But this right here works very similar to this. The difference is, and this would be like your traditional TIG setup, so everything works the same. You still have a collet that goes in there, but it uses a longer cup. The gas shielding isn't as good because the gas comes out these ports and not in line, like in what's called a laminar flow like this provides. So anyways, I use this guy. I'll bring a torch back here. So we'll reassemble this. So the first thing you're gonna wanna do is put your gas lens or your collet body and thread it all the way in until it stops. Okay, it's tight. Then you wanna take your tungsten with the collet, put that in there. You can run into issues if your O-ring back here is wore out or doesn't seal properly on your torch. You can get gas leakage here 
and you can wind up getting uh, improper gas flow out of your cup, which you can get porosity issues with that if you're not careful. So make sure you have spare O-rings and swap them, them out as needed. All right. With this tight, the tungsten is held in there tight and won't move. If this does not tighten properly, and even with this all the way down, you can still move the tungsten, it's not going to pass the current properly through that. You want to fix that. It's very easy to use the wrong fittings or the wrong collets. Like here's a longer style that is incompatible with this. Well, if you were to try and use this or the wrong parts, it won't tighten. You want to make sure that that's tight on there. So this guy right here, which is a number eight, probably impossible for you to see it. It's a number eight cup. They make cups in all different sizes. And let me show you, like you got this guy here, which is probably a number five. You got this guy, which number 12, they have ceramic that are shorter. You have like Pyrex of different sizes. So you got all these different cups. What you have to understand with these, with TIG welding is the wider the cup, the more gas flow you need, but the wider the cup, the better the argon shielding is. So like if you need to weld stainless or titanium, you need to be in a bigger cup so you have more of the welded area shielded with gas, with argon. If you're welding steel or in a real tight spot using smaller cups or in aluminum will generally work better than the bigger cups. Most of these, if you look, they're either ceramic, this is ceramic even though it's white, and then you have the Pyrex or high temp glass I'm a bigger fan of the ceramic cups. The reason is, and this is a perfect example, all it takes is a little ding on something hard and these crack. Same thing, this one's cracked as well. I have a bunch of these, but uh, it, it literally one, one millisecond of a mistake and they hit it against something hard and they crack. So I'm not a huge fan of those over the ceramic. When you're welding on something say into a corner having, if you take this off of here, I'll use this guy. When you're welding into a corner, the visibility is better with this because you can actually see through the cup, but that's really to me the only advantage. So let's get these out of the way. All of the cups for the most part in North America are labeled. Like I had mentioned, this is a number eight. I had 12s, some of them aren't numbered. What a number eight refers to is the width inside of the cup in sixteenths of an inch. Now, I know you're probably saying the same thing I did, and, well, that doesn't really make any sense. Why sixteenths instead of some other measurement? Like, a number eight is eight sixteenths. I mean, this could also be known as a half-inch cup. Well, for whatever reason, that's what they decided. So, a seven, number seven cup is a seven sixteenths cup. A number eight is eight sixteenths. Number 10 is 10 sixteenths. That's just how they are. So the higher the number, the wider it is. Let me thread this back on here. This is known as a stubby gas lens. You can tell because of how small the cup is. A non-stubby lens would be something more like, got one here. This would be like a jumbo. So you see the size of the lens and the size of the cup. Well, if I were to thread this onto this with a different white adapter, you can see the physical size of the torch would be pretty big. And that can be an issue getting into tight spots. All right, now that you guys have a pretty good idea of the torch and argon and all the tungsten, we're gonna get into some more pretty boring but very important stuff, so. Spared no expense on the doodle here. So basically, TIG welding, which the, here's your welder, here's your TIG torch, you got your ground clamp, your work. TIG welding functions on DC EN, or DC electrode negative. What that means is that your polarity 
is set where your TIG torch is hooked to the negative of your welder and the ground cable is hooked to the positive, which is opposite of a lot of other welding processes like stick welding with 7018, 6010, most commonly is done DCEP or electrode positive. And what you have to understand is when it's the first two, they're referring to direct current, so not alternating current or AC. Second two, electrode negative. Electrode is referring to either the torch or realistically the tungsten. Or in the case of stick welding, it would be the stick uh, rod itself. Or in MIG, it means the wire or the gun. So DC electrode negative. The reason you weld on DC electrode negative with TIG is that the heat goes from the tungsten or the torch into the workpiece. On electrode positive, the heat goes from the workpiece to the tungsten. If you were to attempt to weld steel or pretty much anything on DCEP with TIG, the tungsten is going to liquefy because of the amount of heat. The arc is going to be really wide and spread out. And it's not really going to be weldable. Now, without really going into electron theory to explain it, because obviously most of you out there always thought that current goes from positive to negative. Well, if you understood electron theory, you would realize that it's far more complicated than what it appears on surface value. I'm not going to really cover it. What you need to understand is the whole TIG process works on heat. Stop looking at it as like amperage. Start looking at it as heat. So on electrode negative, heat goes from the tungsten to the workpiece. That's what you want. Now on AC... For welding aluminum that actually welds on both electrode negative and electrode positive and it flips between those it alternates i now i'm going to do a video on alternating current in depth dealing with welding aluminum so i'm not really going to cover that much beyond that because there's so much to know but just understand that on conventional tig welding of steel stainless Titanium, everything but magnesium and aluminum is always done on DC electrode negative. So make sure that your TIG torch is hooked to the negative side of your welder and the ground clamp is to the positive. And then that will work for you. All right, with the basics of the TIG torch down, I think you guys will understand where we're at. I'm going to cover more about the tungsten itself as well as the argon gas that's used. So the tungsten, which as you already know, and I'll move this out of the way, is this piece right here. This is the T and TIG welding or the T and GTAW uh, as a reference to tungsten. Tungsten very simply is used because it has an extremely high melting point. Basically, you can melt metal like titanium and steel and aluminum uh, and liquefy it, and the tungsten stays in one piece. Now, let me grab this pack here. Tungsten generally comes in uh, unsharpened sticks, and they're referred to by both the alloy that they're made from as well as the diameter. Now, this piece right here is a 332nd diameter. These right here are 1 16th. I'll pull that out. You can see a little bit thinner. So I generally use 332nd tungsten for everything. It's good to about 220, 250 amps on DC and around 200 on AC without much of a problem. And you can weld razor blades with them. 1 16th tungsten may give slightly better arc starts on very thin stuff, but honestly, I just find uh, 332 sharpened to a point does most of anything I needed to. So besides the diameter, like I had mentioned, they're all uh, different alloys. So I use 2% lanthanated, which is the blue band. Some people use 
uh, 2% zirconiated or 2% uh, serrated or even 2% um, what's a red band called? Uh, thoriated. So thoriated tungsten is probably the only one I wouldn't recommend trying. The reason is, is that thorium is a radioactive element and when you alloy tungsten with it, it still is radioactive. So not only is it tungsten radioactive, but the grinding dust from sharpening it is radioactive. Now, I'll be honest, welding in, its, in general is not good for your health. The dust and the fume isn't good. But I kind of draw the line where if you have a radioactive element that you can simply avoid just by not buying radioactive tungsten, kind of made sense to me. So I never really used a lot of thoriated tungsten. It works, but I don't see the need to use it in today's world when you have 2% lanthanated. I personally, that's all I use. I find it works as good, if not better, than almost all the other blends like E3 and all those other ones. So if you, if you want to buy tungsten, my recommendation, just get 2% lanthanated and be done with it. So let me grab my torch here and put the tungsten back in. Like I had mentioned, the TIG torch passes both electricity, current, and argon gas. Argon gas flows through this cup around the tungsten and shields the area that you're welding on as well as it shields the tungsten. Now, if you remembered, tungsten has an extremely high melting point. I mean, it's the highest of any kind of non-radioactive metal. The problem is, is that that's if it's not exposed to oxygen. If you don't have shielding gas, which in the case of TIG, uh, argon is generally used, if you don't shield that red hot tungsten with something to keep oxygen from attacking it, once it gets red hot or even close to that, it's gonna start getting consumed and it's gonna essentially oxide and burn up in the atmosphere. So that's why you use argon gas. The argon flows out of this cup and protects the tungsten. You can also use helium. A lot of you old school guys will remember when it was called, TIG welding was called heliarc welding. That was in a reference to helium being used as a shielding gas and an arc in reference to the arc that you have when you weld. So. Nowadays, nobody really uses uh, helium gas unless you're doing something very critical or very thick aluminum on DC for like stainless titanium or just straight steel. There's really no benefit to using helium. And it's so expensive right now that most people, it just doesn't make any financial sense to use it. So we pretty much use uh, argon. And argon is what you can use to weld stainless, titanium, aluminum, pretty much every conventional metal that can be welded is all done with one bottle of argon, which is something that's really great with TIG welding is that it's not like MIG where you have to have three, four gas mixtures in different bottles, depending on what you want to weld. It's just with TIG, it's one bottle, just straight argon, and you pretty much can weld everything. All right, got another doodle for you guys. So this is your gas cup. Here's your tungsten. It's depicting an arc and then your molten pools kind of down here. Again, no expense spared on the quality here. So your arc gap, which is a very common term you're gonna hear me talk about and very important to understand. When I say arc gap, that is the distance between the tip of your tungsten and essentially the weld pool. Now, if this weld pool had more metal in it, like you just dabbed your filler rod, it would be higher. But it's the distance between here to the weld pool is your arc gap. What most people get wrong when learning how to TIG weld is their arc gap is simply too big. Now, the question is, well, what's a proper arc gap? Generally speaking, with uh, on steel and titanium, everything other than aluminum, you're going to want to shoot for an arc gap of about 1 16th of an inch, maybe a little bit more, all the way up to maybe an eighth, and that's about it. A good, easy rule to remember 
whatever the diameter of the filler rod you're using, which like this right here is 1 16th filler, if you're using 1 16th filler, that is approximately your arc gap that you want. So if you take your TIG torch and you touch it to the rod here and then move the rod out, that's about the arc gap you want, which in the case of this, I mean, that's not very much of an arc gap. If you're way up there, like in this depicts like, I mean, well, obviously an inch, but again, it's blown up. If your arc gap becomes too long, what you're gonna notice is just like in this picture, it's gonna widen your arc cone. So the longer your arc gap, the wider your arc cone, and the higher the voltage. So on the TIG process, you run what's called like a fixed current value, constant current, variable voltage. When you set your TIG machine to say 100 amps, and you start welding and your foot pedal is all the way to the floor and you have 100 amps, that's all you're gonna get. However, as you increase the arc gap, in order for that arc to maintain, the machine will up the voltage, which then puts in more heat. So by long arcing it, the higher the voltage will be, the more heat input. And you also lose control of the arc. The arc will start to wander around once the arc gap exceeds, I would say about 3 sixteenths of an inch or so, maybe a little bit more than that, the arc will start wandering. Uh, the weld puddle will start pooling weird, where rather than having a nice defined shape, it'll start looking like a kidney bean or something where it's all oblong. So you want to keep a tight arc. Like I said, with steel, if you're using 1 16th filler, like what this is, keep about 1 16th of an arc gap, of an inch arc gap. Now, the other thing worth mentioning here on AC which I'll be, again, doing a whole video on that. On AC, you have both current, aka heat, passing from the tungsten to the workpiece, and then you also have current, or heat, passing from the workpiece to the tungsten. That's why, if you weld on AC, you're gonna notice that your weld puddle, as well as your arc cone, is gonna get much wider. And that's because current is coming through the workpiece back to the tungsten as well as coming out of the tungsten down. If you were to weld aluminum on DC current, which you can if you use helium, you would have a similar arc width uh, as steel does. So a narrower arc, but on AC, your arc cone has to be wider simply because of the way the current passes from the work back to the tungsten. Another thing worth mentioning, like I had mentioned before, gas flow varies depending on what cup you use. If you're using a big cup like this number 14 or a number 12 like this, your gas flow has to be higher. If you were to try and use the same shielding gas, which the smaller ones like this, you can get by on 10 to 15 cubic feet a minute, bigger ones, you're up in a 28, 30, 35 range, maybe a, even a little bit more than that, same with this guy. You want this whole area of this tungsten right here and this weld pool area to be shielded with argon. So the longer your stick out is, the more shielding gas you're gonna need and the longer the stick out is, the wider the cup you're gonna need. If you were to run this small of a cup and try and push that tungsten out this far out of the cup, you're gonna have serious issues where the tip of that tungsten is gonna oxide because there's not enough gas. Versus if you swap it to like this guy, this can handle a much longer stick out. A good general rule is, whatever the diameter of the inside of the cup is, is the maximum distance of a tungsten stick out you want. So in the case of this, I mean, you're talking almost an inch, maybe a little bit more. What you see here is actually a realistic amount of stick out you could run with this cup. Let me move that out of the way. Another thing worth mentioning, and I'll do a quick doodle here. This is your 
gas cup and then you got your tungsten and then we'll just draw this. The area, this has kind of got a, like a push angle, which is fine with TIG. You generally want to push. And I'll depict the arc here. So here's your arc. Your gas shielding that comes out of this cup kind of comes out in this, I'll just doodle this here, in this area. And then your weld pool, of course, is right where the arc is. As you progress forward with your weld, the area that's shielded behind the cup, as you can see, the gas is coming out here, isn't really a very long distance. So by going with a wider cup, like here, your gas shielding actually exists, say, further back here, which is, this area is bigger. That's important and relevant because, especially with stainless steel, that weld, as it turns from molten to solidified in this zone here, the hotter it is when it's exposed to oxygen, which is back here out of the shielding gas area, it will form oxide. So with stainless steel, rather than getting nice, say, yellow or silver welds, you're going to start getting dark gray or burnt looking welds. And that's because your argon shielding area here is not adequate. So if you're welding on something that has an issue with oxides like stainless steel, you got to run a bigger cup in order to get more shielding as and gives it basically gives the weld more time to cool down so that when it loses that shielding that it's uh, cool enough to where it doesn't severely oxide. All right, let's talk uh, about some machine stuff. Big welders. So right here, I have my Dynasty 210, the new one that just was released. And I understand this is a pretty high-end unit, and most of you guys out there are probably working with a lot less than that. The great thing is you don't really need to have something this expensive to get really good results. TIG welding really comes down to the person doing the work as far as what you can get out. At the level I'm at, the features this machine has are beneficial. If you're just starting out or intermediate, a much cheaper welder will do everything for you that this really does at your, at, based on your skill level, I guess is what I'm saying. So like for years I spent with a TIG 200 square wave from Lincoln, which nowadays is considered a pretty low end uh, TIG and stick welder. That was, work phenomenally for me and even five six seven hundred dollar tig welders out there on the market now uh can do a lot so don't think that you have to get something this high end but just as a machine overview we'll talk about my machine and a lot of the features are going to be similar to what yours will i have a foot pedal here this one happens to be wireless Works just like if it was wired. You're probably running a wired one, that's fine. The front of the machine has a gas hook up here. That's for the TIG torch. This down here is a DINS connector for the power output. If you look, the gas comes down into the connector for the TIG torch and connects internally there. Some machines use what's called gas through DINS. You don't have a separate gas line like this. It's all essentially in the connector. Uh, a lot of machines are like that. That's pretty decent. I like it. It's one cable versus two. Right here we have the ground hooked up. Now this machine does not indicate positive negative on the terminals. However, um, this is positive on this side. This is negative. This device here is just a receiver for the wireless foot pedal. Normally you would plug a, a wired foot pedal into there. This unit happens to have a digital display. That's pretty new. There are other companies doing digital displays. So that in the future is going to be far more common, but that's what this has. If you just simply have a rotary knob for amperage adjustment, then that's how you adjust your amperage. This uses the same way, but you have a lot more features that are adjusted through here. Now, this is a 210 amp TIG welder. Most TIG welders come in uh, what I call the 200 amp class. 
And what I mean by that is their max output is somewhere between around 180 to 220 amps. The reason you see so many TIG welders in that range is because that's a really good range for a general use TIG welder. On steel, it's going to be rare that you're TIG welding above 160, 70 amps unless you're really flowing out a lot of metal on a weave or something. So for steel, titanium, stainless, you're well under 200 amps. Um, like you're never really going to see that kind of numbers. Now on aluminum, 200 amps is what I would consider the bare minimum for a TIG welder on aluminum. 200 amps can barely weld quarter inch thick aluminum uh, with proper penetration. And realistically, you'd have to preheat the aluminum with that 200 amps to get proper penetration. So 3 16 thick aluminum is about the limit of what you'd want to weld without a preheat with uh, a 200 amp class machine. And that's why when you start seeing like Miller, their higher uh, amperage output, the Dynasty 280, 300, um, the 350 and the 400, all of those and even bigger yet are for welding really thick aluminum. That would be the primary reason why you would need that level of output is for the aluminum end. So if you don't really want to weld a lot of aluminum, don't need to, you're fine with a lower amp machine. I mean, even a 160 amp TIG welder, if all you're going to do is steel, would have more than enough output. But the second you talk about aluminum, you really need to up your amperage capability if you have any ambitions on that. So this machine, I'll set it up like we're going to weld uh, DC EN for uh, TIG welding on steel. So got it hooked up to the torch to the negative, ground on the positive. I'm going to go over to process and this is already on DC high frequency start. Your machine may be a little bit different, but you want to make sure it's set up for DC TIG. And we're set up and we hit home. This particular machine will go down to one amp on DC. That's stupidly low. Most machines only go down about 10 amps on DC, which uh, you can weld razor blades at 10 amps. So that's not really a huge deal. Anything under 10 is pretty, pretty low and almost, I don't want to call it useless, but you're probably not going to need it. So 10 amps, um, this particular machine starts uh, between 10 and 15 amps for an arc start. And that is actually adjustable. Most machines it's fixed. So what you're going to find is most machines will start at about a 10 amp when it starts a high frequency arc, uh, the starter, and then it backs down to whatever you set it. So like in this case, set at 10 amps uh, on a normal machine, it'll start at 20 and then immediately back down to 10 once the arc is lit. Other than that, the gas solenoid, uh, this has a built-in solenoid. I would highly recommend getting a machine that has a built-in solenoid because what that does is when you press the foot pedal and the arc starts, it starts the gas flowing. And then when you're done and you lift off the foot pedal and the arc cuts out, the gas stops flowing. If you don't have a machine that has that, you end up using what's called a torch valve and you have to manually open and close the valve. Basically, you end up wasting a lot of argon with a setup like that. It's a lot more convenient just to have a built-in gas solenoid. So you're gonna wanna typically uh, buy a welder with um, the gas line hooks up in the back of this welder. Most welders out there, it's the same deal. You've got your power cord and your gas solenoid hook up on the back. Other than that, we're set up for DC TIG, and I will do some demonstration videos now of what you're looking at. And we're going to be doing high frequency start. All right, guys, I'm going to be doing a high frequency start and a little short one inch weld here. As you watch the arc start, you're gonna see that there's quite a lot of wandering to it. Like you can see that right now. And I apologize for the video quality. This is the first time I've ever tried to film an arc. So as I get better at it, obviously the results will be better. But you can definitely see how much it's wandering around. Now, a lot of that is due to the fact that tungsten isn't very sharp. 
so the arc is kind of wandering around the tip. It's also because the amperage that the start is at is very low and the arc gap is also very big. So as you watch as the amperage increase, the arc stabilized and it no longer looks kind of like a tornado. And the molten puddle, which there is one, is going to start growing as the amperage increases. And this will all come into focus a lot better pretty soon. But as that puddle establishes, and I dab that filler in, you're going to see the puddle rise a little bit, and then I progress forward. And the rod basically through, like, I don't want to say capillary action, but through surface tension, wicks right to that molten puddle. And this is like 100 times slow-mo, so it's definitely slowed down. But you can see the second that rod touches, it wicks right into that puddle. And I'm just dragging that molten puddle along and dabbing the filler as needed. Yep, wicks right in there. This arc gap is a lot bigger probably than you'd want to run. I'm simply welding this while looking through my iPhone in a weld lens, so it's pretty difficult to see. But you can definitely see the arc cone itself is pretty narrow. When you weld on AC, it's super wide. Yeah, and you can see even the molten puddle is kind of shaped. It's like a bean or something. It's not a distinct round leading edge of that puddle which is a good indication the arc gap is too long. Anytime you start seeing that either the amperage is too high or the arc gap itself is too long, because if you tighten that up, it'll clean that leading edge up. And then here I am tapering out. That's about 15 amps. Still maintaining a solid arc there. And then it'll click off here. The finished weld obviously doesn't look too good, but uh, have no fear. Yeah, there you go. I can actually weld. All right, I think we pretty much covered the basics of TIG welding. I'm going to be doing a lot of videos that actually cover more in depth and teach you how to TIG weld. But for right now, I think I covered it pretty good. So anyways, all I want to say is, thanks for watching.